Okay, Yan, Leoni, thanks so much for your insightful speech, giving us an excellent start of our retail summit. So today's theme is inspiring the new era of retail. But from Leoni, your research, it seems to give us a, quite a bit of wake-up calls <laughs> for the city. So I, I would like to ask both of you, from your experience in the region, Asia Pacific, and also Greater China, why do you think Hong Kong is slower? And then are there any ways that we can fast track to catch up, you know, to narrow the gaps and also improve our customer satisfactions? So, yeah, you want can, to move first? Yeah, I can start with this one. I think digital is not that complicated. But a lot of people who are ob above 40 and didn't touch that before may found it's a lot more complicated. Uh, if you look at how we work now uh, and who we work with in my business, I mean, our partners in terms of digital application, 30% of them did not exist 18 months ago. We have a leadership position in China with Weibo and WeChat because we started to work with WeChat in 2012, when there was a lot of people who have no clue about what was WeChat. Uh, I love to be surrounded by millennials and listen to what they do and listen to how they use it. Uh, and I will go even further. I'm learning a lot from my eight years old daughter about digital and how to interact with it. I think it's about listening and looking and how people and especially younger people are engaging and getting inspired by them and not being shy to take risks and try new things, I mean, again, including new application. I mean, there is a big monsters like Google, which are inevitable, but there's maybe a lot of smaller, new up-and-coming application where each business being one of the early adopters and taking some risk can really take a lot of benefits. So how about you, your views, Leonie? Yeah, so um, Hong Kong's kind of interesting. I mean, I've, I've been in uh, digital for a very long time, about 19 years now. And it's quite funny, actually, what I say to the millennials in my team is keep up because I've been doing this for a very long time <laughs> and I've seen a lot of boom and bust. I survived the dot-com era and the tech wreck and my standard joke is I still have the capital loss to pr prove that I was there in 2001. <laughs> so I remember Black Tuesday like very well. So, you know, it was only my house deposit that disappeared. But um, I think the thing that holds back Hong Kong, to be honest, is there's two things. Mindset in terms of the willingness to embrace new and talent, to Jan's point. So one of the things that we really need to do in Hong Kong is have a mindset that change is good, that embracing digital is not about disrupting what you have today, it's about complementing that for the benefit of your customers. They're already online. I mean, to Jan's point again, the millennials are already online. In fact, Everybody here is online, 98% of these smartphone users, and that's everybody from an eight-year-old to an 80-year-old are going online every day in Hong Kong. And yet, where are we? Where are our government services today in terms of the ability to use them on mobile? Where is the ability for you to be able to easily find what you're looking for online? And we were talking about that earlier, Janice, wasn't it? I actually have, you know, my couch looks terrible at the moment in Hong Kong. My cat's destroyed it. I want to buy a new couch. I can't find one. I'm searching and I have money to spend and I cannot find a retailer in Hong Kong easily on mobile or on my desktop that has the product that I want. And I find that really interesting in a city that looks as modern and as connected as Hong Kong. So that's the two things that I'd say. It's very much about the mindset and secondly, it's about having the right talent to really drive a lot of this adoption in your own business. Do you see talent, you know, is a major issue that kind of um, make us less um, speedy in terms of this kind of technology to adoption or more about mindset change? It's about, you know, be bold and don't use, you know, convenience as an excuse for us not moving forward. Yeah. I mean, what we have experienced uh, in Greater China, but being in Hong Kong as well, is, I mean, it's more about mindset than talent. You may have super talented digital people in your organization, but maybe your culture and the way you operate doesn't allow them to show any form of creativity or taking initiative. 
I mean, that's a cultural shift that we made several years ago, which I can tell you, as a leader, sometimes may feel not very comfortable. There is a bunch of young guys over there who are using the money of the company to do things I'm not even sure I understand. But you have to go over that. At the end, if you communicate clearly your purpose, where you want to go, you will have this bunch of young people and you tell them, guys, you are accountable, but you also empowered to make the right decision. The other thing which is absolutely vital and complicated for a lot of company, the digital pace has an inherent conflict with the old company governance. If you need to have 10 level of approval before you post something on WeChat, or you post something online, or Instagram, it's too late. It's not hot anymore. You have to be able to react like this, which means empowering the talent that you have already. Yeah, I think uh, one interesting or amazing thing that we see from Yen's presentation is about personalizations. You know, treat your customer as individuals. So um, can you share with us, uh, after launching all these initiatives, what are the major uh, business results or benefits you have achieved? So as to inspire people to work more towards that direction. I mean, uh, I'm looking at my investor relationship lady. Uh, for this kind of, uh, of question, I no, will- No reporters here, no worries. <laughs> yeah, but if it's not publicly information, being a publicly listed company, I will not disclose too much. The only thing I can tell you is that you can look at our last uh, several quarters and I should say years of result, and we are very pleased with our result for this business. Great. So um, it's amazing to see your example about the customer journey thing. So how do you motivate or, or you know, have a culture at the store level so that they can treat customers like their friends? It means sometimes it means a lot more work to them. Um, and maybe, you know, okay, I'm just selling things. You need to meet, connect customer every day. is quite tiring already. So how do you kind of motivate them to do that? So we started, in fact, around five years ago, a, a dramatic cultural change. And what we discussed about uh, uh, leveraging your talent in digital was part of that. First, you have to create a very clear purpose. I mean, at the end, why do you have fashion brand? At the end, asking yourself, why there is coach here? I mean, there is so many brands. Why the customer needs coach? When you define your purpose, you define your value proposition, and we believed at this time, I mean, I can share our purpose, everybody has a dream. Not everybody necessarily has a huge money to spend on their dream, but everybody has a dream. Everybody wants to use fashion and luxury to recognize and discover who they are. We have a unique proposition of very long history, incredible craftsmanship and quality, fantastic customer experience, and great value for customer. We want to be as inclusive as possible. That's our purpose, to have as many people entering and being able to recognize and discover themselves through coach. You communicate this purpose very clearly, over and over again. Mm -hmm. Every year, twice a year, I'm meeting all of our 3,000 sales associates. Mm -hmm. We do roadshow, so you communicate the purpose. Then the other piece is autonomy. You need to break some of the old governance. Some people may love to come at 9 a.m. and finishing at 6 p.m. and having everything they will do between 9 to 6 already scripted. But not most of the people. And I can tell you, especially younger people, they hate that. They hate to be direct. They want to have the autonomy to do what is the right thing when they see the right thing. So when you explain the clear direction and you give autonomy to people, you generate an incredible level of engagement. People will not complain about that. You know, if you have the choice between you see a customer and you know what, you engage in the conversation you want with this customer, does the customer feel like that? Or you say, no, you have to start by saying this, then that, then this, then most of our, most of our sales associates prefer the second option. Mm -hmm. That's a lot more valorizing for them. Mm -hmm. Then the last part about people being too busy is meaningful. We had three magic words, purpose, autonomy, meaningful. Meaningful was, in every part of organization, we are fighting against what I call useless job. If you're doing something that is not helping, building the brain in the heart and the mind of the customer, stop doing it. 
and see what happens. And I gave the example. I used to write a weekly report to all of the board every week about the business. Mm -hmm. I stopped doing it. Mm -hmm. Nobody wrote me about where is your report. <laughs> and I know what. I share that in town hall with all the employees. Say, guys, if I ask you something, why don't you challenge me saying, why do you really need that? That's very true. Purpose, so autonomy, meaningful. So that's how you eliminating all the meetings and you know reports. You know, focus more you on customers. You still need some meetings, but useful one <laughs> with a clear purpose. <laughs> so, Leone, do you have anything to add? Because you work with so many you retailers. We do. So, I mean, the, the, there's points of the customer journey that, that Jan's talked about, which is really important, and I think. Um, one of the things in terms of online to offline is that digital is a supplement to the experiences that people actually want to have. Um, for some retailers, it's the whole experience. So then they actually have to think about how they supplement, you know, those sorts of interactions into that when they actually don't have a physical store. So what are the differences there in terms of efficiency, etc.? But I think um, even for my own team, you know, I, I, I have a large sales team here in Hong Kong and we're dealing with our own customers every day and we, you know, we have a journey as Google in terms of wanting to keep those people loyal to us. And the thing that I would actually say to my own team about customer experience is that it, it is pretty simple. Um, intrinsically, the people who are serving customers need to be happy, right? There's nothing worse than ringing a call centre or going into a store and you're greeted by somebody that's not happy to be there. They actually need to be happy and to, to welcome you like a friend and I think you talked about that as well, Jan. They need to be proactive, right? But they also need to be preemptive. And when I say preemptive to my team, I'm like, predict when something might go wrong for your customer. Remove that waste. If they don't need that report, let's not do it. Let's actually use that time for something more valuable. And then the last thing they need to be is innovative. So it comes back to the point I think that Jan and I would both agree on, which is the, the innate creativity that is required today for service. So we really want to embrace that empowerment, that creative thinking as well, but drive innovation at its core and very much around the customer. So innovation, not innovation for innovation's sake, but innovation that's actually driven by our customers as well. So that's what we would look at is happy, proactive, preemptive and innovative. I have a funny uh, comment to do that, to speak about that. I, I shared with you about one of the service, which is you now a global service for coach, which is if you buy a coach bag, which I invite you to do as soon as possible, uh, three months after you will receive an invitation to come and clean this bag free of charge. That was created four years ago in a tiny store in Taiwan. During a store visit, one set associate and one store manager told me, you know what we do? We have our VIP, and every time they buy a bag, we invite them back. Three months later, nine months after, it was active in all the store worldwide. So let your team come with innovative ideas. And if they are good ones, running out as fast as possible. It seems that every organization has, really has a lot of ideas. It's a matter of how we unlock them. Yeah. OK, so um, now we are in the only channel you know, world. So there's a lot of discussions about what physical store, the role of physical store should play. And of course now US is facing a, 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 you know, a retail apocalypse that uh, stores are closing, then people are you know, wondering you know, exactly what the future role should be. So what are your views on that? Maybe Yen, you can talk about it because you emphasize so much on the store experience. I think it's maybe different from one category to the other. I mean, every product have more or less of emotional connection and personal implication. I think the higher you go into a strong emotional connection or a strong personal connection with a product, the more the face-to-face -face experience and the sensitive experience will be important. I mean, as I tried to display during my presentation, I mean, we are social animals. We love to interact with each other. We love also to have social experience. I mean, touching a leather, touching a fabric, smelling it, uh, having interaction with a third associate in a nice environment when you, you feel comfortable. I don't see that disappearing at all. I, I think uh, looking at the e-market report for this as well in terms of the closures of um, retail in the US, I think one of the things there that, that strikes me is this relentless pursuit of growth. Mm. Um, so for a, a lot of the bigger retail chains, 
Um, growth for them meant more store openings. It was a measure of success to keep opening stores. I'm not sure that when they looked at their data around whether they were the right locations or whether those stores would actually be economically viable, that it was done the right way the first time. This pursuit of growth kind of, they lost their way around who were the customers that they were seeking, where were those customers actually living, what does convenience mean for them, and even, in fact, which sort of products do they want. So we saw a mass expansion of some of the, the retailers, I think, it, almost like a hubris around growth and the pursuit of growth. Um, and at some point, that growth actually stops. And I think, again, to Jan's point, it's when you have to start looking at productivity and efficiency. If you can remove waste in those transactions, you'll actually increase the profits. So there is another way to actually make money for the retailers, which is not just about pursuing growth through store expansion, but it's actually looking at the net efficiency of your customer journey, your supply chain, and how you're actually you know, putting all of mm -hmm. those things together to get products from idea into the hands of the customers as quickly as possible. That's very important, understand our customer journey. I know. It's going back to that. So I believe there's a lot of questions from the floor. Shall we look at some of them? So here comes one. He said, um, unlike China, Hong Kong e-commerce scene seems fragmented, which may, um, may make adoption difficult. For Hong Kong to catch up, should we focus on a few e-commerce platforms rather than everyone develop their own? So, Yanni, would you like to yeah, address this? For, for me, there are already a, a myriad of choices here in Hong Kong in terms of the e-commerce platforms that you can um, that you can use, from small ones that are designed for a, a basically a one store, um, all the way through the very large um, platforms which are designed for uh, multi retailers. Um, and in fact, conglomerate type groups. But I don't think the question here in Hong Kong is simply one of e-commerce. If you think about the stats that we presented around 4.68% of e-commerce in Hong Kong compared to 95% in store, but 50% of all transactions being influenced by some digital touch point. The thing that's missing in Hong Kong is really the digital basics. And, and that's why I started with such a simple product like Google My Business because it surprises me that I go to India and, you know, the bazaar, the sari owner in India, in the very local market that I took an auto to, is on Google My Business, and yet the Hong Kong retailers are not. Um, so something's actually held us back from even just having the right digital touch points that are free to be able to be discoverable before we even get to the transactional systems of e-commerce. Because e-commerce is great, but then you also have to think about fulfilment, yeah. right? If you're going to have e-commerce, how are you going to fulfill those products? So if you come back to the point about selection, price, and availability, if you open an e-commerce store, how are you going to ensure that when we can compare all things as being equal, that the price is the right price, that the availability is there, and that you'll have the service to be able to get that product into the consumer's hands? So for me, I really think it's a, it's a point of starting with those basics, making sure that you've got an effective online presence, but particularly mobile. If you haven't started yet, skip desktop, go straight to mobile first, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> and there's lots of ways that our company and others will help you. You'll hear a lot about that today. We're all very helpful. <laughs> you can Google that under helpful. It should come back to me. <laughs> But quite seriously, we, we just want to see Hong Kong retain its position as the jewel of Asia, right? We had that reputation. I mean, Janice, you and I have spoken about this before. My yeah. mother was here in the 1950s and 60s when Hong Kong was at the height of fashion and innovation and all kinds of interesting things were going on here. And we've somehow lost a little bit of that edge on, a, on the jewel that is Hong Kong. So there are a number of people that will speak to you today, I think, about how we can get some of those basics right and then actually getting to e-commerce platform. Yeah, and then we are glad to see to hear the chief executive explaining the new developments to us this morning. Yeah. Yeah, and how would you respond to that? Because you've been in China. China has been pretty, you know, swift in terms of all these platform or e-commerce developments as compared to Hong Kong. I think there are quite a lot of platforms available in Hong Kong as well. I think uh, on one side, uh, you don't really, I don't know if you need to ask yourself the question about where you should focus. I think the customer will answer for you, that for sure. 
big platform will all want to have a share of the pie. Interestingly, what we see, and which could be very convenient for Hong Kong at one moment, is the rise of social commerce, which means uh, everybody will kind of become its own e-commerce platform in the coming few years. You know, if you have your uh, WeChat account, your Instagram account, your Facebook account, as we, most of us have, I imagine, I mean, very quickly that will be e-commerce enabled. And very quickly, each of us will become merchant. And we get money from the brand by advertising or selling the product we recommend online. I think that's a trend which is coming very, very fast, which is still super tiny, but which I see at the front future. Because again, if we're already connected and I recommend you something, the chance that you will buy is a lot stronger than if the brand comes directly to you. Yeah. It's about trust, you know. So um, if that, uh, does it mean that, uh, if, uh, because Hong Kong has many SMEs, so if I were the SME, do you think now I'd be, be, have more chances to compete in business? Because I will never have resources like a big brand like Coach. Do you see this digital will actually facilitate the development or success of SMEs? Yoni, how, how do you feel about that? Yeah, look... Um, or, or just use Google, we'll, we'll be fine. No, no. <laughs> um, I, you know, ironically, I would never recommend just using Google because <laughs> I think, again, um, and I've been in this industry for a very long time, um, again, it's about who are you trying to reach? Where are your customers? Do you actually know where your customers are today, where they're coming from? Are they only in your local neighbourhood in Hong Kong? Are they outside... Are they across Hong Kong? Are they outside of Hong Kong? Are they coming from China on day trips? Are they international visitors that want to buy something in Hong Kong? So we need to start with that information around who is it that you're trying to reach and what do you know about your customers? Um, I think that's really the key because if we don't start with good data, you, you're literally trying to use a sh an Australianism as like a shotgun approach, right? You're, you're basically just trying to spray resources across a whole bunch of different initiatives and see if anything sticks. There are a multitude of really simple platforms. There are great places to start from some of the biggest players, but there's also a lot of smaller players here in Hong Kong who also have platforms that you can use, whether that's aggregating sites, um, whether that's e-commerce sites, um, things like I think Ricky will talk about um, Hong Kong TV Mall later. So we, we have a lot of um, platforms here in Hong Kong that even the smallest of retailers can use. I think one of the things that I'm often heartened by is spending time in Hong Kong with the startup and entrepreneur community. And, you know, we have um, startups that we've helped, which is just two people in an office, and they've been able to build these amazing technologies themselves to do things like very local tours of Hong Kong. So that's um, Sam the Local, if you've ever come across that one. It's fantastic. So there are opportunities for people to start really small, but they have to have the willingness to, willingness to learn as well. Yeah. You can't rely on somebody else when you're small doing this for you. You have to have the interest and the curiosity to go and find out something about these technologies mm. and then make the right choices based on what you already know about your customers. Okay, so there are another question from the floor to both of you. Again, um, some people say Hong Kong is too small and convenient. That's why our e-commerce adoption is not as fast as China, USA. Again, what's your view on that? So same question, hmm. rise again. So hmm. there may be some issues we have to resolve. I, for one thing I'm quite sure, it's not about small and convenient. That's, I'm positive about that. Coach USA e-commerce bigger penetration is Manhattan, hmm. when we have the biggest number of stores as well. So it's not because it's dense and you have a lot of stores that e-commerce will not take off. I think what I see when I was looking at e-commerce in Hong Kong, uh, a lot of e-commerce in Hong Kong is in fact cross-border. That's the reality. And that's what is growing the faster. Uh, so maybe there is a question for, and we ask ourselves, I mean, what is our value proposition? What do we really want to provide to the customer? What are they expecting, to your point? I mean, understanding better the local I think the other reason is also because maybe a lot of businesses are influenced by tourists. I mean, tourist business and tourist customer are still a big part of the pie of the business. So a lot of the money and intention is focused about how do I grow my tourist business, maybe too much. And we, w we are thinking here about how do we interact with the Hong Kong local customer in a better way. 
Yeah, you have something to add? Yeah, I, I do. I mean, you know, this was the argument that was used seven years ago when I um, moved to Hong Kong about Hong Kong's so convenient you don't need to have digital or e-commerce. Um, but we do. So at the moment, um, you know, less than 5% of Hong Kong's retail is e-commerce and m-commerce. Um, globally, that number is going to edge up to 15% and greater. So more and more, we're actually seeing um, that, especially for a lot of the everyday items, um, digital is really important. I mean, even when we're talking to consumer packaged good companies who are dealing with major retailers here in Hong Kong, they're interested to understand what the customer journey is. You know, how many times has somebody actually bought that brand of diaper or that brand of um, shampoo? Um, are they a loyal customer? Are they only going to your retail outlet or are they going somewhere else? And how do we increase that stickiness? And it, it's, it's fascinating to look at not just e-commerce because for a lot of those brands, they're still relying on the traditional retail path, right? But what they're also doing is they're supplementing that customer journey with educational videos. So in the, in the case of one of the hair care products here, um, they actually again looked at the data that they had on their own customers when they were online. What were they searching for to do with hair care? And the initial thing they thought was it would be about, you know, dandruff or hair fall or all these standard things that you would think about for hair. But the customer insights that they actually got was that young women were looking for the latest hairstyles. Obviously, that's not me. But the younger women were looking for things like the goddess hairstyle and how to do a fishtail and all these kinds of interesting things. And that insight then allowed that shampoo product to create a range of videos around the latest hairstyles and through, again, this online to offline integration could actually track that back into the store in terms of picking up that product, getting more sales for that product based on how many people were actually consuming, searching for that video, watching that video and then were being influenced by it to go and buy this product because they'll get a better hairstyle. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's fascinating. I think some of the insights we look for aren't the obvious ones when you think about digital. It's not necessarily just about the purchase. It's not necessarily just about one platform or product. It really just does come back to the customer mm -hmm. and understanding who you're trying to reach and getting more insight about them. Yeah, the message is very clear. So there's one last question here addressing uh, Bien. So what is the position of physical presence stores in future when e-commerce is the world's focus? And uh, what is your company's strategy in investment ratio in e-commerce and physical store? I think looking for the optimal mix. So at the end, the customer will decide. But uh, we really believe that, uh, as I try to convey, to build brand and to build brand lo loyalty, you do that through emotion. And emotion it's easier to create through human interaction. So we don't envision a future when we will scrap our stores or divide by three or number of stores. We want to continue to give opportunity to be close to our customer physically. And that's the way to be inclusive, because that's who we want to be. We don't want to be a selective brand. We select this customer. You are the one who can come with a brand you don't want you. We want to be as inclusive as possible. And inclusivity means you need to have geographical proximity. People should be able to visit and experience a brand within a store and interacting with the, with the people who represent the store. In the same time, we recognize the importance of e-commerce and globally coach as a significant e-commerce business. So we continue to do investment to grow it as well. But it's not one instead of the other. Mm -hmm. Can I make a comment on this sure. one as well? Um, I mean, the, the retail stores, and especially the luxury stores, are part of your brand expression. Yes. Um, and I think, as somebody that's spent quite a long time in, in internet and e-commerce, I do a lot of eye rolling. I probably shouldn't, but I'm a bit of an eye roller. So, you know, I've, I've seen a couple of generations of kids coming through and predictions of, you know, this is going to close and there won't be any more retail stores. And I roll my eyes because I've heard it before. <laughs> Right, 10% today, e-commerce, 90%, 90% of retail sales are still in store, but the store's changing. Being able to navigate that store, being able to find that store, being able to look up products before you even get into the store or while you're in the store, all yeah. of that has actually changed in terms of the, the environment of the store. What we're going to see next is not necessarily... Um, a removal altogether of the retail store. We'll still have that. I mean, my standard joke in Hong Kong 
is if retail was an Olympic sport, Hong Kong, we win gold every four <laughs> years. We love to shop. It's retail therapy. There's a reason we like to get out of our 500 and 700 square foot apartments and go shopping. It's very much part of our life here in Hong Kong. We love it. And that is not going to change. But what is going to change is how that's augmented by digital technologies, how you can use AR and VR in store, yeah. how you get better digital signage, and how even on the path of your consumers going through Hong Kong, they're experiencing things and they're seeing things that give little brand clues, and that might end up guiding them somewhere where they're going to make a purchase. So it, it's a fascinating time, yes. I think, to be in this industry to see how those changes have become real as opposed to what was the naysayers in 1999 saying, oh, well, stores will be dead and, you know, retail assistants won't need jobs. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Uh, I think uh, we are more or less time for uh, our session. Overrun. We see the screen overrun here. <laughs> so once again, thanks so much for both of you on your great sharing today. I think we all learn about you know, the most important thing is knowing your customers, be with them, and also start with some basics. Yeah. So we hope um, in the next few years, Google, Google's research, there are no longer gaps in Hong Kong, and we are one of the leading smart cities in the region. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank very you. Much.